Ooh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, boys and girls. How are we all doing today? <laughs> we are... Yes, we... we uh. No, we're fine. We're, we're just gonna do it this way. We, we are going to continue with our... Well, it's not really a bedtime story segment anymore, is it? It's more cutting-edge social commentary from the Victorian era. <laughs> but we're still treating it as a bedtime story, so shh. Mm-hmm. Okay. So last time we um, ended with a, a introduction to the presidential system. So continuing now. <clears throat> Excuse me. All these advantages are more important at critical periods because government itself is more important. A formed public opinion, a respectable, able, and disciplined legislature, a well-chosen executive, a parliament, and an am administration not thwarting each other but cooperating with each other are of great consequence when great affairs are in progress than when small affairs are in progress. When there is much to do, than when there is little to do. But in addition to this, a parliamentary or carbon cabinet constitution possesses an additional and special advantage in very dangerous times. It has what we may call a reserve of power fit for and needed by extreme exi exigencies. The principle of popular government is that the supreme power, the determined efficacy in matters political, resides in the people, and not necessarily or commonly in the whole people, in the numerical majority, but in a chosen people, a picked and selected people. It is so in England, it is so in all free countries. Under a cabinet constitution, at a sudden emergency, this people can choose a ruler for the occasion. It is quite possible and even likely that he would not be the ruler before the occasion. The great qualities, the imperious will, the rapid energy, the eager nature fit for a great crisis are not required or impediments in common times. A Lord Liverpool is better in everyday politics than a, Ch a Chatham, a Louis Philippe far better than a Napoleon. By the structure of the world we often want, at, a sudden, uh, at the sudden occurrence of a grave tempest, to change the helmsman, to replace the pilot of the calm by the pilot of the storm. In England, we have had so few catastrophes since our constitution attained maturity that we hardly appreciate this latent excellence. We have not needed a Cavour to rule a revolution a representative man above all men fit for a great occasion, and by a natural legal mode brought in to rule. But even in England, at what was the nearest to a great sudden crisis which we have had of late, years at the Crimean difficulty, we used this inherent power. We abolished the Aberdeen cabinet, the ablest we have had, perhaps since the Reform Act, a cabinet not only adapted, but eminently adapted for every sort of difficulty save, for the, save the one it had to meet, which abounded in pacific discretion, and was wanting only in the de demonic element. We chose a statesman who had the sort of merit then wanted, who, when he feels the steady power of England behind him, will advance without reluctance and will strike without restraint. As was said at the time, at the time, we turned out the Quaker and put in the pugilist. As an aside here, this, you can see why this then made the elevation of Winston Churchill during World War II so mm, natural. Winston's elevation. Because you are able to, instead of instead of a fixed term limit, you are able to essentially say, 
this government is not fit. These people are not fit to deal with it. But of course, again, we come back to this question of there are unwritten rules that must not be broken, but once broken, essentially turn this into um, makes it impossible for the system to continue. And yes, exactly. I was just getting to that. Our friend Bojo really has has trodden on a lot of rules for personal power, right? And that's sort of a a a trying to impose a nativist Americanism on the British system. Write that down as well. Bojo trying to impose an Americanism on the British system and in and tram I don't know. What did I want to say? Trampled over it. Right. Let's continue. Ah, blah, 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 the Quaker and pugilist. But under a presidential government, you can do nothing of the kind. The American government calls itself a government of the supreme people. But at a quick crisis, the time when a sovereign power is most needed, you cannot find the supreme people. You have got a Congress elected for one fixed period, going out perhaps by fixed installments, which cannot be accelerated or retarded. You have a president chosen for a fixed period and immovable during that period. All the arrangements are for stated times. There is no elastic element. Everything is rigid, specified, dated. Come what may, you can quicken nothing and can retard nothing. You have bespoken your government in advance, and whether it suits you or not, whether it works well or works ill, whether it is what you want or not, by law you must keep it. In a country of complex foreign relations, it would mostly happen that the first and most critical year of every war would be managed by a peace premier, and the first and most critical years of peace by a war premier. In each case, the period of transition would be ir irrevocably governed by a man selected not for what he was to introduce, but what he was to change, for the policy he was to abandon, not for the pol policy he was to administer. The whole history of the American Civil War, a history which has thrown an intense light on the working of a presidential government at the time when the government, when government is most important, is but a vast, continuous commentary on these reflections. It would, indeed, be absurd to press against presidential government as such the singular defect by which Vice President Johnson has become president, by which a man elected to a sinecure is fixed in what is, what is for the moment the most important administrat administrative part of the political world. This defect, though most characteristic of the expectations of the framers of the Constitution and of its workings, is but an accident of this particular case of presidential government and no necessary ingredient in that government itself. But the first election of Mr. Lincoln is liable to no such objection. It was a characteristic instance of the natural working of such a government upon a great occasion. And what was that working? For it may be summed up in a word, and it is easy to say it was governed by an unknown quantity. Hardly anyone in America had any living idea what Mr. Lincoln was like or any definite notion of what he would do. The leading statesmen under the system of cabinet government are not only household words, but household ideas. A conception not, perhaps, in all respects true, but a most vivid conception. What Mr. Gladstone is like, or what, Mo or what Lord Palmerston is like, runs through society. We have simply no notion what it would be to be left with the visible sovereignty in the hands of an unknown man. The notion of employing a man of unknown smallness at a crisis of unknown greatness is to our minds ludicrous. Mr. Lincoln, it is true, happened to be a man, if not of eminent ability, yet of eminent justness. There was an inner depth of Puritan nature which came out under suffering and was very attractive. But success in a lottery is no argument for lotteries. 
What were the chances against a person of Lincoln's antecedents, elected as he was, proving to be what he was? Such an incident, however, natural to a presidential government, the president is elected by processes which forbid the election of known men, except at peculiar conjunctures and in moments when public opinion is excited and despotic, and consequently. If a crisis comes upon us soon after he is elected, inevitably we have government by an unknown quantity, the superintendence of that crisis by what our great satirist would have called statesman X. Even in quiet times, government by a president is, for the several various re reasons which have been stated, inferior to government by a cabinet. But the difficulty of quiet times is nothing as compared with the difficulty of unquiet times. The comparative deficiencies of the regular, common operation of a presidential government are far less than the comparative deficiencies in sudden, in time of sudden trouble. The want of elasticity, the impossibility of a dictatorship, the total absence of revolutionary reserve. This contrast explains why the characteristic quality of cabinet governments, the fusion of the executive power with the legislative power, is of such cardinal importance. I shall proceed to show what nations can have it and what is the form under which it exists in England. <clears throat> So we are done chapter one. I want to take this moment to just address a couple points that have been pointed out in chat because they are kind of important. Um, let's see, point one, why is America so good and England failing? A couple points on that. America has been good, or mm, let me let me put it this way, has geographical advantages, right? Uh, has, i.e., size, uh, safety, natural resources. I think. So if if we were to compare America to other other countries in the world, uh, the USA has probably one of the best pieces of land that exist, right? Like all of the Midwest is perfect farmland, um, bountiful land. As Actually, we should say has a lot of bountiful land because that's 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 very much important. Has a lot of bountiful land, right? And the U.S. really hasn't suffered in the way that its um, geographical competitors have, right? Like Canada is not really a competitor because Canada. Is too cold, or historically has been too cold. Let me let me rephrase that.、Uh, Canada has been too cold historically, making northward expansion difficult. But whereas the U.S. doesn't really suffer from that problem, if that makes sense, right? Like all of the contiguous U.S.、Uh, U.S. states are, you know, they they have their seasons. But you can plant during those seasons. You can grow during those seasons. You have the natural resources. You have,、uh, you don't have that much mountainous terrain, right? Let's say China has much mountainous terrain and a, let's say, and before nineteen four, um, nineteen seventy, nineteen seventies. Um, lots of conflict and physical and internal. 
right? So China, it doesn't really count as a, a like there, there's not as much arable, quite less arable land compared to the U.S. Uh, Russia has, um, how do we say? We'll, we'll get to Brazil in, in a second. Just let me finish Russia. Has had demographic challenges. And Soviet. And also internal. And internal lethargy. For uh, the last 300 years. And R Russia also, let's, let's keep in mind, Russia is essentially... Most of Russia is also on on, where well, it's too far north as well. I said, uh, let's say Canada like coldness. Come on, demographic challenges. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> Brazil. Uh, I'm just I'm just listing sort of the the geographical competitors, right? In Brazil, no, see that that's the thing, right? Like Brazil simply did not um, had too much internal conflict. Portugal, military dictatorship, and and so and so when we're talking about internal conflict, it means that development simply is stall stalling, right? Like that 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 people can't really do a lot when there is too much internal conflict because the, everyone is just busy trying to address those conflicts. <laughs> And so, why is if we go back to the point of why is America good but England isn't? In part, this is because actually, let's let's finish that thought. America versus England. Um, no external threat. Much larger surface area. No um, cultural. Class divisions. I think I think all of these things together, essentially, essentially, like this means America was in the prime position to grow, regardless of political system, right? And 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 therein lies the key of the point that I'm trying to make, which is that America got lucky very lucky because of its um, geographical location because of how it was developed even 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 the Civil War really how do we say the the damage from the Civil War did not damage industrial centers in fact it encouraged the concentration of industry in those centers oh yeah one second the damage of the ACW did not extend to manufacturing centers or, or let's say to later manufacturing centers like New York City and this man means that um, actually we should say it actually concentrated people such that the network effects were primed for uh, the industrial revolution right and and so <laughs> well it is it is the truth right like or it is let me, let me let me put it this way it's it is the truth as I see it based on on my understanding of history uh, obviously you don't have to agree with me um, but if you don't agree with me, you certainly should make a cogent argument as opposed to just uh, just 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 
spamming stuff like muses, you're wrong, right? <laughs> uh, that would be that that wouldn't be the right thing to do. Let me put it that way. Does that make sense? Excuse me. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll, we'll we'll take that up later. Okay. Now let's start chapter two. In the last ten minutes, yes. <clears throat> Chapter 2 The prerequisites of cabinet government and the peculiar form which they have assumed in England. Cabinet government is rare because its prerequisites are many. It requires the coexistence of several national characteristics which are not often found together in the world and which should be perceived more distinctly than they often are. It is fancied that the possession of, certain, of a certain intelligence and a few simple virtues are the sole requ requisites. These mental and moral qualities are necessary, but much else is also necessary. A cabinet government is the government of a committee elected by the legislature, and there are therefore a double set of conditions to it. First, those which are essential to all elective governments as such, and second, those which are requisite to this particular elective government. There are prerequisites for the genus and the additional ones for the species. The first prerequisite of elective government is the mutual confidence of the electors. We are so accustomed to submit to be ruled by elected ministers that we are apt to fancy all mankind would readily be so too. Knowledge and civilization have at least made this progress that we instinctively, without argument, almost without consciousness, allow a certain number of specified persons to choose our rulers for us. It seems to us the simplest thing in the world, but it is one of the gravest things. <laughs> the peculiar marks of semi barbarous people are diffused distrust and indiscriminate suspicion. People, in all but the most favored times and places, are rooted to the places where they were born. Think the thoughts of those places can endure no other thoughts. The next parish even is suspected. Its inhabit inhabitants have different usages, almost imperceptibly different, but yet different. They speak a varying accent, they use a few peculiar words, tradition says that their faith is dubious, and if the next parish is a little suspected, the next county is much more suspected. Here is a definite beginning of new maxims, new thoughts, new ways. The Im immemorial boundary marks begin a mark begins in feelings a strange world. And if the next county is dubious, a remote county is untrustworthy. Vagrants come from thence, men know, and they know nothing else. The inhabitants of the north speak a dialect different from the dialect of the south. They have other laws, another aristocracy, another life. In ages when distant territories are blanks in the mind, when neighborhood is a sentiment, when locality is a passion, concerted cooperation between remote regions is impossible even on trivial matters. Neither would rely enough upon good faith, good sense, and good judgment of the other. Neither could enough calculate on the other. <laughs> well, this is actually the, an interesting point, right? Because both um, writing uh, the the act of communication has brought the world closer, and so the original printing press brought the world closer for sure, and then the telegram, and then the telephone, and now the internet. And we think that we know people better, that people are starting to not sort themselves by location but by interests, but as animals, it doesn't quite work like that. Even though the future is very close and we think we are sorting by interest. 
we are sorting ourselves by interest we are still herd animals and we still need um, to be involved in our local community. It is the utmost importance for us to, to um, be involved in our local community. Anyway. Uh, and if such cooperation is not to be expected in trivial matters, it is not to be thought of in the most vital matter of government, the choice of the executive ruler. To fancy that, that Northumberland in the 13th century would have consented to ally itself with Somersetshire uh, for the choice of a chief magistrate is absurd. It would scarcely have allied itself to choose a hangman. Even now, if it were palpably explained, neither district would like it. But no one says at a county election, the object of this present meeting is to choose our delegate to what the Americans call the Electoral College, to the assembly which names our first magistrate, our substitute for their president. Representatives from this county will meet representatives from other counties, from cities and boroughs, and proceed to choose our rulers. Such bald expo exposition would have been impossible in old times, it would be considered queer eccentric if it were used now. Happily, the process of election is so indirect and hidden, and the introduction of that process so gradual and latent, that we scarcely perceive the immense political trust we repose in each other. The best mercantile credit seems to those who give it natural, simple, obvious. They do not argue about it or think about it. The best political credit is analogous. We trust our countrymen without remembering that we trust them. <laughs> it certainly is different today. The second and very rare condition of an elective government is a calm national mind, a tone of mind sufficiently stable to bear the necessary excitement of conspicuous revolution. No barbarous, no semi-civilized nation has ever possessed this. The mass of uneducated men could not now in England be told, go to, choose your rulers. They would go wild. Their imaginations would fancy unreal dangers in at the attempt at election. <laughs> would issue in some forcible or usurpation. Oh my god. <laughs> Way to describe what brought Bojo up back in 1870s. 1870s, right? I can't remember when this was written. 1860s or 1870s? 1867. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, one second, one second. Give me one quick second. What was it? Uh, one second, give me... Oh, actually, no. Do I have to go? Yeah, I have to go. <sighs> okay. Well... I will type this up afterwards and then we will continue this discussion some other day. Okay, thank you very much for watching. In conclusion, please download Firefox, please don't do Chrome. And I shall see all of you tomorrow for what amounts to be 20 minutes till dawn. That's right. Bye bye.